Last Sunday's lectionary from, uh, was from John 10, a passage where Jesus refers to himself as, uh, well, as the good shepherd or the noble shepherd. It was an abrupt departure from the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus that we expect to read about in the Easter season. Today's gospel lesson, too, is unexpected, for it throws us back into Holy Week. In fact, to Maundy Thursday, John 15, verses 1 through 8, is part of the last discourse of Jesus to his disciples right before his betrayal. The Last Supper has ended, and they will be leaving soon for Gethsemane, and this is part of what is said. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does not bear fruit he trims clean, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I will abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Abide is an old-fashioned word, isn't it? Dean Leaking comments, Highway motel signs read, Stay here, not abide with us tonight. Baseball announcers don't sum up an inning with one hit, a walk, and two abiding on base. Nor do University of Tennessee football fans breathe easier because Butch Jones is abiding as head coach. In fact, of the 17 uses of abide listed in the Oxford Dictionary, at least eight are obsolete. The word seems to belong to another time. To abide has to do with persevering continuing, lasting, staying. The New International Version translators use the word remain. The New English Bible has dwell, abide. The reality of what it means is as rare as the term itself. Think of the opposite condition of the absence of perseverance, of what does not continue or last or stay or remain or dwell. Friendships break off. Business contracts become thin as tissue paper. Marriage covenants often begun at altars where this passage from John is read are broken in divorce. God alone knows the river of tears and dysfunction set in motion by the absence of abiding in marriage or abiding in friendship or abiding in relationships of any kind. The gospel lesson for this fifth Sunday of Easter takes us back to the night of Jesus' betrayal. And surrounding him were the 12 who would each one of them fail to abide with him in his greatest hour 
of need. Walter Brueggemann once wrote that metaphor, hyperbole, and ambiguity are the very stuff of the Old Testament. Believe me, the same is true of the New Testament, even, perhaps even more so. Where we yearn for clarity and certitude, we find metaphor, hyperbole, and ambiguity. The New Testament is full of imprecise literary configurations. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener suggests an allegory. But in what follows, not every detail has significance. So is it a parable? Well, not quite. Is it a metaphor? Possibly. But it breaks down when analyzed. Jesus urges every branch to abide in him while at the same time affirming that the gardener may or may not prune it off. Surely you see the problem there. Branches don't have the choice of either remaining or departing from the vine. If the branch departs, it's because of decay or, or due to a pest or because of pruning or some other reason. What we have here is John having Jesus make a point through a sort of a broken metaphor. Mark Davis says the metaphor is powerful because of the literary location of this conversation. It's part of a long discourse that begins with the act of Jesus washing the disciples' feet at the supper in chapter 13. The teaching itself begins in chapter 14. And John introduces the whole discourse with these words, now the festival of the Passover, now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And then this discourse ends in chapter 17 with these words, I made your name known to them, I will make it known so that the love with which with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. The point seems to be that abiding is a consistent theme throughout this whole extended narrative, chapters 13 through 17. And the only people who heard this, the only people in the upper room with Jesus from start to finish were the 12 disciples. Actually, only 11 were with him the whole time because Judas left to betray him near the end of chapter 13. So let's see what we have here. I am the true vine, Jesus. My father is the gardener, God. The branches, the disciples. We tend to forget that these words were addressed to those with Jesus. And the you in Greek, which is humes, is plural. <laughs> so he's saying, y'all are already clean because of the word I have spoken to y'all. Abide in me and I will abide in you all. The branches are the disciples. Well, there was one branch that was not, that did not abide in the true vine. And Jesus moves from the plural who mays to the third person singular to discuss the one who does not abide in him. He is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. He, 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 that's Judas. And I suppose the comment about branches such as Judas being thrown into the fire and burned is an allusion to judgment. Like so much of scripture though, I hope you hear this in the, in the fashion in which I intend to say it. Like so much of scripture though, this is not first and foremost a story about us. It's not a story directed to us or for us, 
or concerning us. What message we take from it is derivative. And to inject ourselves into the story is inevitably to moralize it or to diminish its historicity in the process. What we can say, what we must first say about this text is that Jesus pleads with his disciples to abide, to persevere, to stay in him. Disciples that do so live and those who do not do so don't. Branches can only bear fruit if they are attached to the vine. And the good news, the very good news for us, is that the abiding that is described here in John, if you read carefully, is a two-way street. It is not entirely up to us. If we abide in him, he abides in us. I am the vine, you are the branches. The branches grow out of the vine. The vine's life flows into the branches. And you know, the branches do not hold on to the vine for dear life. The vine holds on to them. Wiley Stevens told a story about a member of his congregation who lost his wife. She was young, he was young. They had a young son. The father struggled the day of his wife's funeral. Afterward, he struggled putting the little boy to bed. They were both numb with, with grief, and the little boy kept asking, Daddy, where's Mommy? He tried to answer the question, but the boy kept asking, Where's Mommy? When's she coming back? You can imagine how awful and how difficult that must have been. After several attempts to satisfy his young son's questions, the father finally picked him up and put him in his own bed. And finally, the little boy reached out in the darkness, reached out his hand in the darkness, and placed it on his father's face and said, Daddy, is your face turned toward me? When the father said yes, the boy said, if your face is toward me, I think I can go to sleep. That father lay beside his son and thought, oh God, I am in darkness. I have no idea what the way forward is, but if your face is toward me, somehow I can make it. Amen. When we know we're not alone, when we believe we're part of Jesus and live in his love, what seems impossible with our own limited strength and vision is now possible through his mercy and grace and love and care of those joined with us in the body of Christ. There is no such thing as a vine without branches. There are no such thing as branches without a vine. There are many of us, many of us who care for each other. I have read that giant sequoia trees, which can measure hundreds and hundreds of feet in height and 10 or more feet in girth and live thousands of years in age, have very shallow root systems. And the way they withstand the winds and the stress of so many years is that they intertwine their roots with others drawing their strength from each other. Raymond Brown was the most prominent biblical scholar of our era, my era. I once heard him lecture when I was a graduate student at Oral Roberts University. He was a specialist in what he called the Johannine community, which contributed to the authorship of the Gospel of John. And every time I prepare a sermon on John, I turn to one of his commentaries and I am always surprised by the depth of his scholarship and by his, by his piety. It seems that nothing escaped his notice. This time he caught me with this statement. The original readers, those who originally heard the Gospel of John, 
would easily associate the imagery of the vine with the Eucharistic cup. I read that and thought, of course. What kind of vine is being referenced throughout this text? A grapevine. And where is this text set? In the upper room, Monday, Thursday night, the Last Supper, right before the crucifixion. We observed two baptisms just a few moments ago, baptisms that were initiation rites into our faith. Well, friends, communion, Eucharist, is sustenance for the journey. It is God's way to remind us that his face is always turned toward us, that he abides in us as we abide in him. And because his face is turned toward us, somehow we can make it through whatever comes our way. Amen and amen. Let us pray together. Oh God, we thank you for this record of that last discourse broken metaphor that it is, a bit confusing that it is, nevertheless, words through which we can discern your word to us. We thank you that your face is turned toward us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.